So we'll just start from what I see on my screen. So Philip, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Philip Mosher, Sotheby's Realty. Um, oh boy, there's a lot going on uh, these days. This is the last weekend of the Krista Grimm retrospective in the Hugh Glenn House at 100 West 9th. It's open every day from 5 to 7 until Sunday the 3rd. Uh, please come by uh, and check out uh, really this incredible painter and this amazing Victorian home. Um, I'll mention a couple of uh, Art Center things. I imagine Sally uh, maybe too. Um, our next exhibit, A Life and Pattern, is showing work by the textile artist Laurie Mason. Uh, the opening night reception is next week, Thursday, September 7th, 5 to 7. Really amazing work from a lifetime of artistic expression and textiles. And I'll put these things in the chat too. And then I just also wanted to remind again of the Art Center fundraiser, the Art of Diamonds and Denim, uh, Saturday, September 16th. And I'll put the link for the tickets in the chat. Um, it'll be a fantastic event out at the Pines Estate on uh, Mill Creek Road. Good food, good wine, and a dance lesson. And uh, that's the annual fundraiser for the Art Center. So we hope to see as many as possible of you out there. And uh, I'll put a link for that event in the chat too. And that's it for me for now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Sally? Did Philip steal all yeah, your Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, yeah, it was great. Uh, I can just go up and say, hi, everybody. I'm Sally Johnson. I'm the executive director of the Dallas Art Center. And all of these great things are happening. Um, I also just want to point out, there's a really nice um, piece about our summer camp and this upcoming show in the paper this week. Um, so I hope everybody gets a chance to see that. Um, thanks so much. Glad to be here and thank you. Thanks, Sally. Um, Brian? Brian Tuck retired and just looking for some rain today here, so I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> yeah, it smells good out there, doesn't it? Um, Phil? Phil Brady? Yeah, my mute button was hidden. <laughs> uh, Phil Brady, Wasco County Commissioner and um, I'll leave it at that for today. <laughs> um, Bren, Green? Green Goodwin, Columbia Gorge Food Bank. No major updates for today. All right. Tanya? Good morning, Tanya Brumley with Northwest Natural. Interested to hear from Kenny because our neighbors next door are no longer there. So I'm sure he's gonna fill us in on all the details. It's really quiet out here now. <laughs> Uh, Rob? Good morning, Rob Garrett, Mid Columbia Senior Center. And I have a lot going on this month, next month, tomorrow. So um, I'm on overload. That's uh, tomorrow is September 1st. It begins National Senior Center Month. So what we're going to do here at Mid Columbia Senior Center is we're going to celebrate like crazy. We're having uh, several different little events, one big event. The little event, one of them is uh, the Coffee Connection on the 12th, which is Tuesday morning in, what is that, a little more, a little less than two weeks in that neighborhood there. So hopefully everyone will show up that at the morning at 7.30 here, and we'll have some coffee and some goodies, and everyone can see the new paint inside our building. We just finished the interior paint. Um, right now, I've got electricians installing parking lots. We just finished the striping in the parking lot. Um my goodness, the list goes on. There's plenty of stuff here that's new if you haven't been in a while to see. And then on the 23rd of uh, September, which is a Saturday, from 3 to 6, we're having a block party here. And I'm starting to push that out starting this week. I've been working on it. We hope to entertain as many people from our community as we can. Uh, we're working towards getting all of the people who've sponsored us to come. Uh, for example, Grocery Outlet, Kodiak, Kodiak Grocery Outlet's going to try to make it. The fire department's going to make it. I'm going to talk to the chief of police and see if they can make it. I'm going to try and get the word out to you know people like Phil and the city council and those people to see if they can show up. And we're just going to have as many people here to see what we're doing 
And in response to that, we're going to have free barbecue hamburgers, which uh, we're going to do barbecues and hamburgers. And everyone who does something at the center, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, our pinochle group, we're going to have someone to represent the pinochle group and the quilters and all the things that we do. There's, there's about, I don't know, between 50 and 60 different things happening every week here. And someone's going to be here to talk about it. Plus, to top it all off, Mark Kendrick's going to come in and tickle the ivories for us and play a little piano in the background. So it'll be just a great time. And uh, you'll look look for that. We'll be talking about it on KODL this morning on the radio. And then, of course, the other stations will all be adding, putting in ads and stuff. So listen for it and, and help me to promote it, if you would. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. And um, Dr. Lawson? Good morning. Good morning. I just I just got on. So <laughs> You're fine. <clears throat> Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh yeah. So that's <laughs> what I meant by I just got on. I have no idea what we're doing here. Um yeah, I'm Dr. Kenny Lawson. I'm the pres new president at Columbia Gorge Community College. Happy to be here with y'all. Thank you. Welcome. All right. And um, now we'll turn it over to Kenny. Good morning, everyone. Um, Kenny LaPointe, Executive Director of Mid-Columbia Community Action Council. Um, good to be here with you, although it's early for me. Um, I At first, I thought that when Lisa was breaking up that I didn't have enough coffee yet. So um, it is fairly early, <clears throat> at least for me. Um, it's nice to have some rain out there today. Um, and I wanted to give you all a couple updates from our agency. Um, first of all, uh, and I'll get to the annex of so the Oregon Motor Motel and the Gloria Center and all that kind of stuff. And, and of course, we miss Tanya um, out at Northwest Natural being our neighbor. <clears throat> and we'll still get a chance to make some noise out there for you, Tanya, because we have some work to do still. But um, I wanted to um, give folks an update on our point in time count. Um, for those who are not aware, we do an annual, so it's a, it's a federally mandated account of people experiencing houselessness that occurs across the country. So um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, mandates that communities do these counts um, through what are called continuums of care. Um, and I won't get into the details of what that means because there's a lot of different types of continuums of care, but um, when it comes to homeless services, that's what I'm referring to. Um, the count has to occur in January of every year. I don't decide that. That's decided by the federal government. So um, you'll probably say, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we do it in the middle of winter time? And I say the same thing. And I remind myself that it's the Department of Housing and Urban Development, not rural development. So they are um, asking communities to do this in January, which is very difficult because the weather can be crazy. Um, uh, it cannot be crazy, which makes it very hard to um, to count folks. But we have done a very um, good job of coordinating agencies across the community. Um, Hood River, Wasco, and Sherman counties, those are our service territories as a reminder. Um, we have done a very good job of coordinating with partner organizations. Um, I think we had like 40 organizations that assisted with the point in time count um, this last year. Um, we've been trying to do a better and better job of doing that count every year. So we we begin to get more of an apples to apples comparison rather than doing like a, a sloppy job one year and then a better job the next year because that changes your numbers a lot. So we wanna be very consistent with how we're doing things. Um, and we've done that since um, 2021. Um, we've been very consistent. In 2020, there wasn't much of a count that was done because of COVID-19. Um, I'm happy to report that this year's point in time count, which we just sent the press release out, um, I think it was last week. Yeah, it was last week we sent the press release out. Um, and between 2022 and 2023, um, overall between Hood River, Wasco and Sherman counties, we saw a 5% increase in houselessness in the region. Um, fairly minor overall um, from the point in time counts I've conducted, that's a fairly low increase overall. In Wasco County, we saw an 18% decrease in houselessness. Um, and 
you you may drive around the community and see a lot of folks who are who are outside um and they are living unsheltered but we have done a pretty good job of getting folks who are homeless into permanent housing through our shelter system in fact the pala shelter site that um, I'll talk about in a little bit that was next door to Tanya. Um, we we placed 79 households from that shelter into permanent housing um, in the last, in 2022. So um, those folks are no longer considered houseless and that um, has an impact on the number of people um, and has an impact on the percentage of, re of reduction in Wasco County. So we did see a reduction in Wasco County. Um, in Hood River County, we saw the opposite. So um, we saw a 56% increase increase in houselessness in Hood River County. I'll have to say the number because 56% sounds so large. It is 40 individuals more um, that we counted in Hood River County. Now, um, one of the reasons why I really want to emphasize this is because we get, we have a lot of, um, conversation with community members about us ramping up services in Wasco County and that impact that it may have on people coming to Wasco County um, in order to get services. And because of these, these results, these numbers, it kind of refutes that whole notion of if you build it, we will come. Because we've built a strong service system in Wasco County and we've seen a reduction in houselessness. We have not focused heavily in Hood River County, although we do run a shelter, it's only seasonal there. We saw an increase in the county that we did less work in. Um, it's also, Hood River County also has very, Hood River City has the highest, some of the highest home prices, some of the highest rental prices in the state of Oregon. So that causes uh, folks to, to struggle to get rehoused there. Um, so those, those are the numbers that we've, uh, that we just released. They're, I have to say they're unverified numbers, which means that the Department of Housing and Urban Development hasn't gone through them and said, thumbs up, you can like release them with our stamp of approval on them. The Department of Housing and Urban Development, it they take like a year to go through the numbers nationwide. And we didn't feel like we wanted to sit on numbers on data and um, and not provide those to the community. So we have said that they're unverified. Last year, when between when we um, released our unverified numbers and our verified numbers by HUD, the difference was like three people. So it wasn't a significant change overall. So we're pretty confident in, um, in our, our counting, um, the way we did the count. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on that specific topic if folks have them. One, the one other thing I want to mention actually before questions is, um, I believe it was 72% of the overall houseless population that remains unsheltered. So when I say unsheltered, I'm talking about the people you see that still are outside. They're not living in a shelter. So if, if folks are living in one of MCAC shelters, they are considered houseless, but they're sheltered houseless. Um, if they, once, once they get into permanent housing, they're no longer houseless anymore. Um, if they are um, living outside in a tent, on the street, in a car, anything like that, they're considered unsheltered houseless. But 72% of the folks who are remain to be outside, unsheltered, they're living in tents, they're living in cars, also um, identified as having either a mental health or substance use disorder and or. So they could it could have been both things. So we're seeing a lot of folks who remain unsheltered have um, one of those issues or co-occurring issues that um, are going on in their lives. And that we find that that often is, is the reason why they continue to be unsheltered because uh, a shelter environment is difficult for them. Um, it's difficult for them to comply with community guidelines and expectations that are within the shelter system. Um, it also is a scary place for them to go in many cases. So, um, that is is what we're seeing of the unsheltered population and we are unable to force people into shelter unfortunately but we do have the resources to get people um get people housed are there any questions on that can you tell me the kenny can you tell me the percentage of how many houseless we have that are unsheltered 
Um, so in Wasco County, I don't, I don't, it's too early to do the math on this, but in Wasco County, there was 160 people experiencing houselessness and 116 of them were unsheltered that night of the count. Green. So that's seventy-two point five percent, just for the early morning math, folks. Yeah, um, I, was, I was right, seventy-two. <laughs> um, Kenny, with the the connection really between houselessness and food insecurity, just curious if um, if we find an opportunity to to amplify the point in time um, numbers, is that okay if we share some of that information through our channels as well? Oh, abs absolutely. Uh, we we did send out, Breen, I need to get you on um, our listserv um, so that you are getting those press releases because we did send it out to community partners uh, at the beginning of last week. So um, if you want to shoot me an email, I'll make sure to get you on there and we should probably connect anyways. Oh, thanks, Kenny. Tanya? Yeah, just quick clarification. So when you said 116 unsheltered, that would have been the count taken in January then, right? So unsheltered in the coldest time of the year. Correct. Okay, just clarifying. Ugh. Thanks. Yeah, and I don't I don't remember the week of the count. It was not a severe weather situation. Um, like we weren't under a severe weather advisory, which is when, you know, potentially a warming shelter would have been operating. I'm happy to talk to folks about warming shelters and what we've done in the past and what we're not doing and all that kind of stuff, because um, that has been an issue. And I'll, I'll kind of get into that a little too with my other items. Okay, um, the next thing I wanted to update folks on is the Gloria Center or the Navigation Center that um, we are building on 7th Street um, behind like Motel 6 and Coastal Farm and Ranch. Um, we we broke ground on that project in March of this year. And um, this in the next week, we have our foundation being poured um, out there. To date, it, it hasn't been as exciting as the annex from like a change of scenery standpoint. It, it has been a lot of utility line digging, um, kind of the underground stuff that is not super exciting, you know, people throwing rebar around and that kind of thing. Sorry, Tanya. It is exciting. It's very exciting. Um, so we we have all of our utilities in. We have, um, we have our foundation being poured in the next week. And then we have, we, we ordered a pre-engineered steel building that will be there within the next two weeks. And once that gets there and is erected, it's going to be progress fast. So people will see change on that block fast um, because we are not stick building on site. They're not gonna see slow, you know, um, nails and hammers that are putting up a building. It's gonna go really, really quickly. So uh, we do anticipate completion of that building um, and the non-congregate shelter site out there in February probably late February, um, and that's a contractor's timeline. So let's say March. Um, so we anticipate opening around that that time. And as a reminder, we will be moving our offices from downtown to that location, um, our main offices, where we'll be providing utility assistance, weatherization, veteran programs, um, housing assistance, all that type of stuff. We also have DHS will be providing eligibility determinations. We have Inchiwana Housing, who does native um, services in the community. Um, the Center for Living will have co-located offices there. Not, not their, they're not moving their main offices. They'll just have some staff working there. Um, the Oregon Human Development Corporation that serves uh, farm workers in the Latinx community. The Columbia Gorge Health Council is planning to move their main offices there. Um, and then One Community Health will have its mobile medical unit there on a regular basis. The non-congregate shelter portion of the site, which will be on the back, the, this is the this is where we're going to make some noise at um, the current pallet shelter site. Tanya will be out there moving those pallet shelters in our in our shower trailer um, over to the navigation center site, and those 
um, those pallet shelters, let's call them tiny homes because they're not made of pallets, but um, those will be moved from the uh, current site, um, which has shut down as of yesterday or two days ago. They'll be moved from there and staged on the Gloria Center site, which is the name of the navigation center. Um, that non-congregate shelter will operate as a severe weather shelter. It is not a year-round shelter. So it is um, only going to be operating in severe weather situations. Um, with the with uh, the opportunity that came about with the annex of the Oregon Motor Motel, um, we decided that we would sort of convert our transitional shelter operations to the annex site and have um, the navigation center serve as emergency severe weather shelter, which has been a gap in the community. We um, also believe that the non-congregate shelter environment is a much better sheltering environment than having everybody in one big room. Um, having everybody in one big room has been has caused challenges from an operations perspective. And some of you may have seen my letter to the editor last year in CCC News about our experience in operating a congregate shelter at St. Vincent de Paul's site, and it did not go overall that well. So um, we actually ended up shutting down early. But having a non-congregate shelter that is emergency shelter um, will be a much better way to go. I will remind folks that I any... Any shelters that I'm involved in will have community guidelines and expectations, so people will have to comply with rules. It's not a free-for-all. Um, are there any questions on that? We will be holding a grand opening once we get there um, on that project. So. I, I do have a question, Kenny. Uh, this is Philip. Um, you mentioned before um, the comment that often comes up uh, about, um, oh, they're going to bus the homeless people here from Portland and they're all coming from all sides and directions. And apart from the numbers you talked about before, which are so encouraging, that's just awesome to hear. What What is your typical answer to that criticism? Um, so great question. Um, and I can actually get the data out on that because we added a question and I, and I you know, these are self self-reported results, but we added a question to the point in time count this year that asked where people were from. Were from. And I believe it was 70% of the folks that were counted in the point in time count had um, were from this region. So, and when I say region, I'm talking Hood River, Wasco, Sherman, Klickitat, and Skamania counties. We kind of see it all as one, as one region. And we partner with Washington Gorge Action Programs on the other side. They have shelters as well over there. So um, we asked that question. And I believe that um, the next statistic was, I think it was 85% of overall folks had some sort of ties to the community. Family here, they had a job that they had, um, been working in the region. Um, in fact, I, I mean, just yesterday, I met a, a gentleman who was from out of the area, but he's working two jobs um, in, in the Dallas. Um, he's not in shelter right now, but he's working two jobs in the region and he's experiencing homelessness. So um, most of the folks that we see are from the region or have ties to the region in one way or the other. Um, and that's, you know, just the data that we've, we've been able to get. Um, I don't refute that people are here from other places because I'm here from another place. Um, so uh, we do, I've never seen a bus arrive that dropped a bunch of people off. I've heard stories of that that are never validated. Yeah. Okay. I think those are good answers. Thank you. Okay. The, the next thing I want to talk about is sort of the big front and center project, which is the Annex, or the former Oregon Motor Motel. Um, we have renamed it the Annex, and you'll start to see some of the signage change out at the front of that property. And if you haven't driven by recently, you should take a drive by. Um, I mean, I, I at least believe that there's been significant change to that um, block uh, on 200 West 2nd Street. Um, we just did a soft opening of the annex um, on Tuesday of this week. We moved our first clients into that site. Um, we we moved our pallet shelter clients from the pallet shelter site out by Tanya over to the annex. So they um, got to move into their rooms on Tuesday. 
Um, we only had occupancy for those rooms. So we're um, working to get some additional remodeling done in the other rooms and we're going to slow roll our opening. We're not going to just say, we're opening a wait list for thousands of people to apply for. Um, that's not happening. Uh, my staff would probably go nuts and we don't wanna do that. Our infrastructure is way different than it is at, um, that it than it was at Bargeway and Terminal, which Tanya knows this, you know, having people who have to go outside and use a bathroom in a shower trailer um, is much different than having your own bathroom in your room um, along with a shower. Um, it's also much different for my staff to operate in an office, not in an RV. Um, and we're you know, super grateful for the fact that we've had the ability to run shelter at that location but it's just not ideal. Um, we could not provide great case management, standing outside in that super windy location, or if it's winter time, the weather could get really bad. Um, over Christmas, I, I worked on Christmas day out there, the whole thing was a sheet of ice. And um, I had to go through with like a pickaxe and hack up walkways. So we're excited to be in this new location, but getting our team used to that infrastructure is going to take a little time. We've been working with all of our contractors to get manuals drawn up for how everything works, um, but we've done a lot of work out there. Um, by the end of this um, rehab, we'll have put around $2 million into that project. Um, re you know, renovations from the start, we put a new roof on. Um, we put new railings up we stuccoed the building so that blue color on it is blue grayish color it's not paint it's stucco um, we had a great stucco contractor um and I, I have to just say this side story that our stucco contractor because of this job was able to buy a house in the dallas so um it provided by providing housing we provided housing so um that's just a, a great story for this family. He was also able to expand his business and he is a, this is a, um, a minority owned business. So it's a great um, opportunity um, for this family. Um, I'll also say, and I think Commissioner Brady knows this, his work is phenomenal. And we got so many, I had contacts from folks who were opposed to the project at the beginning who asked for our stucco guys information because the building looked phenomenal. So um, it was a it was great to have people correspond with us in that way. We put new windows on the building. Um, we removed all the carpet and we got rid of all the carpet and all the furniture. And for those who don't know this, the Oregon Motor Motel was not known for super clean living environments inside and had um, but on the east side of the building, there were some rooms that had bed bug issues, and we fumigated the building, got rid of all the old furnishings, um, painted, and we put hard surface floors down. So um, we're mitigating that issue. We also, it's kind of a, a fun thing, I guess, we, we bought a bed bug oven. So we have a giant um, bed bug oven in our office at the annex, and everybody who comes in puts their belongings into that bed bug oven and we cook we cook the stuff at like 130 degrees for three minutes and it gets rid of any bugs that um, might exist. So we're trying to mitigate that issue. The cost of a bed bug oven is cheaper than fumigating one room. So we wanna make sure we're, um, we're keeping things clean out there. Uh, we painted the inside. We were also fortunate enough to get an additional $500,000 from the foundation who funded the project to do additional renovations because we were making such good progress on our renovations. So that allowed us to do some bathroom remodels. Um, the bathrooms were not great. So get being able to add some new toilets and some new vanities um, and just some fixtures in the shower were really nice. Um, so those, those things are being done. And that's one of the reasons why we've only opened 17 of the rooms to date, because we're still doing bathroom remodels and we didn't want to move a bunch of folks in and have to move them out and move them back in. So we're making sure we're um, getting all that stuff done. We're going to be replacing the roof on the West building. Um, I think that starts on Tuesday. Um, we also, I think folks know the pool is gone. We're not going to run a pool out there. Um, we're putting in a little 
uh, kind of play area because that side is the family side. This will be the first family shelter that we have in the region, which is great. Um, so there's going to be a little um, sort of hangout area for families and we're putting a fence up, a cedar fence on that side of the property as well. Um, and then we were fortunate enough that the City of the Dells Beautification Committee gave us a small grant to do um, some landscaping on the front side of that west property that faces the island sort of in the middle of the road. So we're going to be sort of matching the island with landscaping out there um, that'll look really nice. Um, we expect sort of full completion of the project by the end of September from a renovation standpoint, depending on how things go with our balcony. Um, folks may notice that the balcony has not been, uh, the railing has not been replaced on the balcony. Well, that's because we're concerned about uh, the wood underneath it. So we're probably going to replace the wood. Fortunately, it has steel framing there, um, which will support a new, a new deck, but we want to be careful about how we do that. So that area is kind of shut off for the time being. Um, I think that's the main updates on there. We do have a grand opening event scheduled for October 12th at 11 a.m. and would love to have you all attend. Um, our plan is to have that on the family side of the annex um, so we can kind of show that side off. Um, and then we, we will be offering some tours um, of, of rooms and spaces at the annex on that date so folks can take a look inside. It is night and day difference. This place, no matter what anybody says, this place was a dump and the the infrastructure was horrible. Um, there was one water heater serving 39 rooms. Um, the, the manager's apartment had electrical run with extension cords through the drywall. So it was just in very bad shape, which kind of makes me chuckle as we go through the permitting process and the county asked me if we did this or that. And I'm like, have you been out there before? Um, Cause you may want to ask them some questions about what was going on, but that's kind of where we're at with the project. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And I will say that when we move folks in on Tuesday, um, there was a lot of tears from staff and from clients. We heard, we had multiple clients come up and say, after we we gave them their key to their room, they they said, are you, sh they went in their room and they said, are you sure that this is for me? Um, and they were crying and, you know, gave our shelter manager a big hug, um, but they're super excited to be in a much, just much better place for them. Let me jump in, Phil Brady. I'm, yeah, I'm watching this from the, the being on the board and Kenny has been managing so many projects at once. It's It's been amazing and uh, really working hard and, is, and likewise with the staff there. I, he knows and he says they are really overstretched, but they've been pulling together. It's, it's you know, uh, building the airplane while flying. Uh, great job. You might hear some people complain. One of the complaints was that we're making this too good, which is a terrible thing to say. Uh, I've, as I visit the rooms, I, I compare them to my college dorm, not my children's college dorm, which are much nicer than my college dorm. But it's 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 comfortable. It's it's neat. It's 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 not luxury apartments, but it's so it's, it's going to make a, such a difference in people's lives. It's wonderful to see. I will say the building looks so much better. Um, it's really looking really good. Thanks. We we do want. Um, we want to do a mural um, on the wall that faces the the turn, that like kind of by Montiras or old Montiras. We have that big open space on that wall, and we're hoping that we can get a mural done out there. So we've been trying to to look into um, how we can make that happen. We should work together uh, on that, Kenny. Um, I'm sure the Dallas Art Center would love to collaborate on uh, finding the right person for you. I'll take it. I'll reach out to you. Great. I can't remember if you mentioned, does the facility have Wi-Fi? I believe. 
Yes, we have we have Wi-Fi in there. We're trying to figure out the best way to provide access for clients to that without having everybody streaming. Um, the, the rooms don't have TVs in them, so um, they're not using TVs, but they will be using, you know, their their mobile devices. And we want to make sure we limit the access, but also provide access so they can do things like apply for jobs and stuff like that. We also have office spaces um, and meeting rooms there that they can utilize, um, you know, to, to do things like apply for jobs and stuff like that. So we're still working on setting some of those things up, um, but we're, we're getting there. Um, we have laundry rooms for clients. We have staff laundry room um, and meeting spaces. And there's multiple staff rooms across the site, also for co-located partners. Um, to work out of. And we have security. I mean, Wi-Fi is throughout the site because we have security systems out there. So um, our our security, I think we have 15 security cameras on the site that are all managed from inside the office from multiple monitors. Um, and we do have security that is on site uh, every day from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. And they will be, I think, the security company we're using is um, just acquiring their um, security vehicles and they'll be parking those in the front. So if you see those parked out in the front of the project, that does not mean there is a problem going on. Tanya? Can I, yeah, I have a question. Um, just wondering how now with the transition, I was I was going to ask you how that went with the clients. So I appreciate that you brought that up. Um, I'm sure that was extremely emotional, a big change for them. And so I'm just curious now with the move, how does the food situation work? Do they have little kitchenettes or are you having like a cafeteria style presence out there at the new facility? Yeah, good question. Um, maybe in the future, we would have a cafeteria. Right now we don't. Um, putting that infrastructure in is pretty a pretty large project. Um, each room has a mini fridge and a microwave in it. We have, um, we're just setting this up today, actually, but we have a contract with Meals on Wheels. So they provide food. Um, we used to contract with St. Vincent de Paul. We don't anymore. We contract with Meals on Wheels. They've been bringing food out to the pallet shelter site. And basically they just transitioned to bringing um, the, the food out to the annex. Um, so we we deliver that food to the clients and they can heat it up in their microwave and um, and eat in their rooms um, or they can go out. We have picnic air, picnic table areas and stuff at the site. There will be more of that coming as we complete construction um, so they can eat around there. Um, but that is the food plan. They, there is a today we're building out our our dry our dry pantry storage so folks can access that um, to get additional food. And we also have um, we're. A, a food bank partner organization and um, we're working with gorge grown as well to get additional food out there um so we're we're trying to do as much as possible with the the limited space we have to give food um and when it comes to like when people have food in their rooms uh i tony i think you know this we inspect rooms every day so all rooms are inspected every day to make sure that folks are keeping their room tidy and clean and we don't end up with like a bug problem because there's food, perishable food that's been left out or anything like that. And we are happy to discuss with anyone who wants to talk about, you know, volunteer opportunities to provide food to clients and that type of thing. I think as we get things set up more and more, you know, having like the community provide a barbecue for the clients would be great. Um, something along those lines. We're just not quite there yet. We have had a lot of volunteer opportunities. In fact, I think we've had 80 volunteers out at the site who have helped to clean rooms and put together furniture um, for the rooms because we we put in all new furniture on the east building, bunk beds and wardrobe cabinets. I uh, Kenny, you, you remind me of the story you told about the person for whom keeping the room clean was a uh, a life skill that needed to be taught. But I was going to ask you to um, also talk before we, uh, well, I'll take you off topic here of the annex, but the things that McCack is doing in Hood River and the connections to Hood River. 
Yeah, so in, in Hood River, um, we actually just remodeled. Uh, there was another project that we were working on. We remodeled our office in Hood River, which is not super large. We have been working with the Mid-Columbia Center for Living to identify a, a location to site a satellite navigation center. Um, so that is something we've been actively pursuing. I actually, we made an offer on a pro property that we didn't get. Um, so we, we've been actively trying to get something done there where we could have a more permanent shelter and office location. We're leasing our office space, we're leasing our shelter site. Um, so we would like something that's permanent. And we, our shelter in Hood River is a seasonal shelter. So it opens um, about around mid-November and runs through mid-March. Um, we will be opening that here in a, I don't, I don't even want to think about it, but in a, in a couple months. <laughs> and I think, you know, uh, Commissioner, when it comes to like the life skills stuff, um, there's a program called Ready to Rent or Rent Well, where you kind of go through a ready rental readiness education course. And um, I, I don't think I said, but everybody who comes into our shelter has to be on a housing case management plan. So they have to have a sort of path to get out of the out of the annex within six months and move into permanent housing. And we have housing case managers who are working with them on that, but they have to enter a housing case management plan and they have to be making steps forward on that plan. Um, ready to rent is a class that kind of teaches you how to work with a landlord, how to take care of your unit, all that type of stuff. But it's not in a real life environment. It's like in a classroom. We see the annex as the real life environment of being able to teach people some of the, those life skills that will help them be successful when they get into permanent housing. Believe it or not, a lot of people's parents didn't teach them those skills. Hey, Kenny, how how is the uh, success rate on the people you've housed? Are, are they staying pretty, is it close to 100% once they're out there? Or are you seeing people go back into houselessness because they're just maybe mentally falling back into old habits or or with addictions or things of that nature? Just curious. We've had about an 85% success rate at keeping people in permanent housing. And we've actually, that's in our makeshift operation too. So we've we've been, I, Commissioner Brady said, you know, building the plane while we're flying it, we are doing that in some ways. And we've added two new positions. They're, they're parallel positions, one in Wasco County, one in Hood River County, and we call them housing retention specialists. And their job is to continue to provide case management services to people that we have put it placed into permanent housing. So we're following up and making sure that they're um, getting what they need to be successful in the place that they're at. Um, we have had a couple of people come back to the annex in the last couple of days and say, wow, this place is really nice. I, I wouldn't mind living here instead of my home. And we're like, that's not an option. So could you speak to why, what the 15%, I mean, it's pretty easy then I guess to figure why the 85% might be successful, but what, what's causing that 15% to lag? Yeah, so for some of them, it was, they were in rental situations that ended after a year and weren't able to find another option. So um, we had quite a few folks that we placed um, actually in Cascade Locks um, and the place that they were, they were placed in ended up converting the units into uh, vacation rentals. So um, those folks lost their housing. We did. We were able to um, rehouse them, rehouse some of them in other locations, but some of them were not able to be rehoused and had to go back into shelter environment. So, um, in you know, in a few cases, there is mental health um, challenges uh, or job loss that occurs, and. Sometimes that's tied together. Thanks. And you just want to lift up, there's a question for you in the chat from Lisa as well. How many rooms, and this is, I think, for the annex, how many rooms will it have total? Miss that number and um, a little bit more on the family versus individual accommodation. And yeah. Resources. Sorry, Lisa, I forgot that you were chatting in the chat box and, um, instead of vocally there. Um, so on the, 
the east side of the property, there's two buildings there. Um, we have the west side and the east side. The west side being the one that's like sort of closest to Lisa and then the east side um, closer to the Dalles Inn. The east side has 39 rooms. Um, and we have converted some of those rooms into like lounge space, laundry space and staff rooms. Um, so I think we're probably at about 35 rooms that are going to be accessible for clients over there. That is the individuals and couple side. So no children on that side. Um, that side, most of the rooms have two beds in them. Um, some of them have one. Um, we could, I could tell you that we could have a hundred beds, but we're not going to because my staff would go nuts and um, I would probably go nuts too. So I think once we're at, like, if we get to full occupancy at any point in time, we'd probably have somewhere around 60 to 70 people total. Um, that's if we ever get to full occupancy. We really would like to, for the time being, we would like to keep the rooms to single person occupancy or couples occupancy. So we're not like putting um, unrelated people in the same room. On the family side, we have 15 rooms over there and two of them are offices. One of them is a manager's apartment um, and another one is an office space. And then we also have a laundry room. So three of them are offline um, for other purposes. Each room could accommodate a family of four. Obviously that's tight um, for a family of four. Those rooms are actually fairly good size, um, but each room has a queen size bed and then a bunk bed for kids. So um, that's what one of the rooms is an ADA room. It could just accommodate one person, but the others could accommodate um, up to four people. Okay. Um, Phil has a question. Yeah, a couple of follow up things. Um, uh, I'll throw them out there and you can have, or answer them sequentially. <clears throat> is this, all, <clears throat> excuse me, is, are these spaces, if they are available, also um, available in case of like smoke emergencies? And um, talk about also your very good strict policies regarding drugs, people using drugs on or off site. And maybe Tanya can attest to that as well. Yeah, we we have so we have some rooms that we're calling surge space. So if there is a severe weather event, a smoke emergency, you know, these these rooms all are energy efficient. They have new heat pump systems. So, you know, from a clean air perspective, they could help. The pallet shelters don't do that. They're, like if there's a smoke event, it's not really that helpful to be in those things. So these units could potentially provide some smoke shelter. But again, like if somebody is willing to go into a shelter in a smoke shelter situation, the question I would ask is why aren't they in there already? Um, because it, it comes down to compliance with rules. If they're coming in for smoke shelter, they're going to have to comply with the rules and community guidelines. Um, and one of those rules being you cannot use drugs or alcohol on the site. So um, it's, it's a behavior-based environment. So um, if somebody were to go, let's say they, they went and had a drink downtown, like probably many of us do and then go back to the shelter and go to bed. I don't really care. If they go back to the shelter and try and fight my shelter staff, they will not be staying there anymore. Um, and that's whether they're sober or intoxicated. So it doesn't really matter if they try and do those things in either case, um, they will be asked to leave. Um, typically we give people like a, you have, you have a, a step system. So if you violate like the first time you're asked to leave for seven days, if you violate a second time, it's 30 days. And then the next time you're, you're out for a year. So um, there's some opportunity built in there, but people cannot use drugs um, or drink on our site. That's absolutely not allowed. Well, and I would like to add to that, Phil, uh, too, is this, Kenny, you guys have been very good neighbors. Um, I know we've had lots and lots of conversations over the years, and they've always been good and very productive and very constructive. And so I I do, it's this weird kind of context that, oh, you guys are gone. They're kind of, you know, it, there's nobody over there right now. It's just so quiet. And yet it's it's a sign of progress. So that's exciting, too. 
but the staff was always nice. If I would drive by, you know, I was always waving to everybody there. And so it is kind of this, uh, like your, like your big sister, your little sister grew up type thing. So I, mm -hmm. I am excited for you guys in that fact. And I do, I do have to say as a community partner, I know there's a lot of businesses downtown that were, are really still at, at ill will about what's going to happen, but I, I can only express what we've experienced and it was total professionalism. You guys were always there for us when we had concerns and most of the time, or I should say all the time that we had concerns, they were always addressed. Uh, and, and the concerns weren't always about your own clients. They were about uh, other people that were having issues that didn't live at the center, but you and uh, Rob took care of it or you knew them because they were, uh, you know, street people, I guess you'd say, or people who may have been through the system and out of the system. And and I just can't uh, thank you guys enough for everything that you have assisted us with and our concerns in our company. And and I really wish you well. And and I will miss seeing you and Rob <laughs> around the corner every now and then. I'll have to stop by and harass him over at the annex. Yeah, we Tanya come out whenever you would like. And and anybody, um, if anybody's interested in like a tour of the site, uh, reach out to me and let me know. Um, you know, we we will our staff either Rob Mendoza, um, who who is scary looking but a big teddy bear. Um, he will be walking the neighborhood. So Lisa and Lisa, you may see Rob come by and like check in and see how things are going and if you've had any issues. Um, Sky Morgan, who I think many of you know, mm -hmm. is also on our staff now and is one of our housing placement specialists at the Annex. He will uh, also be one of the folks who's working with downtown businesses to connect and make sure that things are working well. And if you're if you're seeing any challenges, um, we'll try and mitigate that. We're also working with the city and the Mid Columbia Center for Living and the county to establish a downtown outreach team that is a behavioral health focused outreach team um, that would be that would be located within the center for living it would be on their staff um, but would probably be stationed at the annex and would work with downtown businesses to address the concerns that i mean i know um the chamber has like uh you, you've got St. Vincent de Paul right there. There's a lot of folks living in Mill Creek. Uh, most of the, those folks are people who are unwilling to come into our shelter environment for one reason or another. And um, these behavioral health caseworkers, outreach workers will be able to go work with those clients um, around that area. And what I'll say, one of the reasons we can do this and why it's not being done now is because the Center for Living is very restricted to only being able to work with red, like, behavioral health clients that are signed up with Center for Living for Services. We've we figured out a path to braid funding between city, county, MCAC, and Center for Living that doesn't have those restrictions on it. So Center for Living staff will be able to work with those folks and try and get them signed. I mean, the goal is to get them signed up for behavioral health services. So um, we're trying to figure out a way to address those issues. Um, there will be more to come on that. We we want to be very clear about what we're not doing, right? And like one of the things we're not doing is picking up shopping carts. Um, I know that's a huge concern, and and I have the concern as well. Um, in fact, we're putting a sign up on our property that says no shopping carts allowed on the annex site. So, um, but that's that's going to be coming soon, and we've been working with, like I said, Matthew Cleves and the county to try and figure out. Um, how to get that set up sooner rather than later. Our goal, I think right now is by January 1st. That's great news. Thank you, Kenny. Any you know, other I, questions? I just have another quick comment for Kenny and it's yeah. a kudos again is the one thing I think I'm gonna miss the most. And I think you guys might notice it when, when you're downtown and the clients uh, or residents are there is, I could see when a new client would come into the housing and because they would walk, you know, if the bus didn't stop here, they would be walking and they walked Bargeway, they walk terminal and they walk over on Weber. And I could see the transition in some of these folks, they come in, it looked, you know, often addicted to, or with mental health issues and now they're getting treatment. And I could see the physical transition of these people from their appearance and you could tell they were getting healthier 
And that to me was very exciting to watch. And then all of a sudden they weren't there anymore. And I'd, right. I might check in on occasion and it was because they'd moved on. So I think that's really exciting to see these people in our community and see these successes. And I know it's not going to happen with every single client because, you know, people are people, but I think the work you do is strong and it's important. And I just, again, thank you. You guys have been great neighbors. Thanks, Tanya. Well, we'll see if I can talk without breaking up, but thank I had to switch to a hot spot on my phone. <laughs> but thank you, Kenny. I really appreciate just being up front with us and having some numbers and the success stories and those things going on. Um, I know my team and I will probably take you up on that tour uh, so that we can go and better spread the positive. Um, I think once you're ready, we need to do a ribbon cutting with all of your tenants included so they can be a part of that um, and celebration um, parts of that. So, um, and as always, everybody have a great weekend. Lisa, thank you for being my backup today. Really appreciate that I have that team. Um, and we will be back to somewhat normal next week, I promise. And uh, with that, don't forget, we have First Friday tomorrow. We've got a concert down at Lewis and Clark Park, and they're doing that for, I believe, you can use canned goods, um, and that can be your entry, so you don't even have to pay to go to a fun concert. Um, so all of those efforts are happening all over our community. So we we do have a really, a very caring home. Um, and so with that, everybody have a great day, and you take care, and we'll see you next week.